Um, it's been it's been a wild week in the media community. Uh, a rare digital portrait of Deborah Harry by Andy Warhol resurfaced and is now available for sale, carrying a $26 million price tag. This distinctive piece of digital art was created back in 1985 on an Amiga 1000 home computer and includes an Andy Warhol signed floppy disk containing 10 further images. And today we've got the person behind this with us, Jeff Bruett. Jeff, it is a pleasure and an honor to have you on the stream today. Uh, how's it going, Jeff? Very good. Thank you very much for having me, Bill. Uh, Jeff, I'm so excited to talk to you because you know I love I love Amiga and I love art. Um, you know, I was growing up, I was really into art and video production. That's what I do for a living today. I'm a cinematographer, and because of the Amiga, like the Amiga, like really gave me a jump into my career. It was the first, you know, as you know, home computer for uh, for artists for the creative types. And so when I saw the Amiga 4096 colors, it just it just blew my mind. So the Amiga's played a huge role in my life as well as a lot of the lives of the folks who are watching right now. And um, the, the, just the iconic Andy Warhol, Deborah Harry launch of Amiga portrait has just been something that's been like burned in our, our brains uh, for forever. Um, so I'm super excited to, uh, to hear about, about it resurfacing and about your, uh, your sale and your acquisition of it. I want to hear all about it. But Jeff, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself first because you actually worked at Commodore uh, back then. So uh, tell us a little bit about what you did at Commodore. Sure. Um, actually, originally I was hired uh, to do computer graphics for VIC-20 video games, working in the what was called the VIC Commando Group, alongside of Andy Finkel, Bill Hindorf, Eric Cotton, um, under the uh, management of uh, Michael Tomchek and uh, Neil Harris. And so uh, eventually, the 64 came along, of course, did programming for that as well. Probably the, the game I'm known for is um, doing uh, the programming for Wizard of War for the Commodore 64. One of my favorites. And, oh, uh, really? Yeah, 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 it's a great two-player game. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it was also one of the, I think, only a couple that you took advantage of the Magic Voice uh, synthesizer. Um, but anyhow, so... Uh, Along came the Amiga, and the games group kind of got disbanded, and most of the programmers ended up over in engineering. But I took a different direction, and I only I actually uh, shifted over to marketing, which is kind of a odd direction for a programmer to head. But uh, they needed someone to do computer graphics uh, and write little programs. Uh, for use in the commercials, things like that. So it would look like, let's say, somebody was supposed to be doing word processing, but there was no word processor available yet for a new computer. So I would actually uh, make sort of a simulation of a word processor. So the actor would sit there and didn't matter what key they typed on the keyboard, it would type the correct letter on the screen as they were typing. So it was things like that. I also did graphics for the packaging, uh, collateral materials and such. Um, Brilliant, so you're the guy would, in the movies when they're sitting at the computer and people are like, wait a minute, that's not how the program really works. You're the guy who actually makes the program that goes on the, on the monitor. <laughs> exactly, I, I, and I actually did that for, um, back then I did, did that sort of thing for uh, Miami Vice, for uh, an episode of Steven Spielberg's Amazing Stories, Max Headroom, uh, a movie called Disorderlies. Um, so oh. I, I did a lot of that sort of thing at the time. Oh, that's fantastic. But that's a very unique niche uh, you, you carved out for yourself <laughs> at Commodore. It's so cool because you're an right. engineer, but at the same time, you're still being creative and, and artistic and you know working in film and TV. Max Headroom is you know one of the, the shows that is just so synonymous with me to like the early 90s. I did, and uh, people said, you know, there was always a rumor back then because information wasn't as freely available back then as it is today. And everyone's like, oh, they, they, they made Max Headroom with an Amiga, the original Max Headroom with Amiga. Now, but it was, uh, from, what, the, what, from what I understand, it was just the backgrounds, right? But you're the one who did it, so why don't you tell us? I, actually, <laughs> actually, the backgrounds weren't even done with the Amiga. Oh, no. No, um, <laughs> no the background, the, the Amiga had nothing to do really with the Max character. Max was, uh, Matt Frewer wearing a, uh, a mask and um, 
it was just a solarization effect that they were doing in post-production uh, and superimposing it over uh, canned video that they had previously done making the, the kind of that grid line box or whatever you'd want to call it behind him. Uh, the only thing the Amiga did was uh, what we called techno babble. Uh, the, all the, the prop uh, set graphics or we did also use the Amiga for uh, secure cams and view phones when Edison Carter would, would be calling somebody on what was the FaceTime of the day. <laughs> um, the, the superimposed um, blinking record light or uh, things like that, that was all done with the Amiga, but um, Max himself had nothing to do with the Amiga. Um, amazing. So it's good to know. I mean, my heart's broken a little bit, but at the same time, it's good to know Amiga still touched the Max Edmund show a bit. <laughs> yep. Yep. And, and actually, there were there were dozens of uh, Amigas hidden throughout the set, um, feeding the monitors. Uh, so it was there when when I got that opportunity to work on Max Headroom, I called back to Commodore and told them the opportunity, and they sent out, I think, a couple of pallet loads of um, Amigas, uh, as I recall, most of them, I believe, were Amiga 500s, but there were Amigas all over the set. Oh, awesome. So were you actually a Commodore employee at the time working on Max Headroom? Were you no. freelance at the time or just working for the show? No, at, at that time I was freelance and had left Commodore. Um, I left Commodore in early 86. Got it. Play of Ellie, thank you so much for the raid and the resub. Play of Ellie, you rock. I know it's play time, but we've got a very special guest. Welcome, everyone who's joining from Play of Ellie's stream. We're talking with Jeff Bruett today. We're talking uh, his time at Commodore, and the, we're going to get the backstory behind the famous Andy Warhol, Deborah Harry portrait. I know I've been reading a lot of uh, articles about it, and there's uh, a lot behind the scenes that I didn't know about the Warhol portrait. But while we're talking about like cool shows that you worked on with the Amigo, like let's just continue with this for a minute because I know folks watching are going to sure. be really interested in this. So you had Max Headroom, uh, that was done on. What other shows did you work on uh, that that the Amiga touched? You know, everyone knows like Babylon well, Five and the Toaster, but I'm curious. I, I, I right. Yeah. I, I I actually never. Uh, I had kind of moved on from uh, to different things at that point. Um, after uh, the other thing, I worked back then with. I uh, worked with a group called Oingo Boingo in Southern California. Uh, a lot of people don't really, may not know Oingo Boingo. I, I worked on that with uh, their um, uh, lighting engineer, Charlie Unkelis. And But uh, uh, a lot of people do know the lead singer from Oingo Boingo. Mm -hmm. uh, his name is Danny Elfman and went on to do all the scoring for Edward Scissorhands and Nightmare Before Christmas. And so he's known more for those things. But um, uh, when they did, when Oingo Boingo did live concerts, they had the big screen monitors and we created all sorts of animations uh, that would play throughout their concert on the big screen. Wow. That's incredible. I, I have heard of Oingo Boingo, but I didn't know that the Amiga touched uh, Oingo Boingo as well. I mean, Danny Elfman is an absolute legend. <laughs> I mean, he's uh, it's one of those composers where Tim Burton's movies wouldn't be the same without the, the Elfman score. Exactly. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, uh, any other, any other uh, cool Commodore well, or Amiga behind the scenes uh, TV stuff you'd like well, to share? Um, another one, um, there used to be a channel that you would Back before we had our interactive TV guides, you would tune to, and it would the lower half of the screen would be scrolling what programs were coming on, and at the top would be advertising of one sort or another. Um, that was it was called the Preview Channel, and um, Dave Berezowski, who was one of the uh, also used to had previously been with Commodore in the Games Group. Uh, he and I designed that for United Video. Uh, so the preview channel was all done with Amiga. And um, he did the software on that. And I did the design of the fonts and um, the look and feel of that scrolling uh, 
uh, guide, I guess you'd call it. Jeff, that's incredible. Two things about Preview Guide. That's another thing that I'll never forget from, from the early 90s. I'll never forget, well, I'd sometimes turn on my TV and I would see a guru meditation you know, on the Preview Guide. And I was like, yeah, they're using Amiga, amazing. <laughs> that's, one, <laughs> that's one of my favorite memories. Because you know, as, as much as we don't like the Amiga to crash, at least when it crashes, it goes, it goes down in style with the guru. <laughs> uh, nothing, actually, on, a, on another note, that you'd be, I should be interested in, I was telling you about Vintage Computer Festival East. Um, there's this, this young guy, he's, he's a young guy from California. He, uh, he and his friends actually recreated the preview guide. Uh, somehow they found the software for it and they actually have it uh, you know, uh, displayed live and they're actually pumping in the actual uh, like TV data for that day, when, you know, modern data into, right. the, into the preview guide and they have it up and running. And on the Amiga, I think it's a 2000 that they have. It's really, it was Do one of my favorite exhibits. Do you do you recall his name? Was that was his name Ari? Yes, Weinstein? Ari. Ari is his okay. name. Yeah. Yep. yep. <laughs> and, and and do you and do you know what Ari's cl real claim to fame is? I don't know. Um. Oh. Now I'm sorry to draw a blank on on the iPhone where you can program it to do sequences of activities. What? what oh is that? yes. Yeah, I know you're talking about. They're like the shortcuts. Shortcuts. Yep. He was the he was the inventor of shortcuts. No way. He never. That's and, amazing. <laughs> and and he he's actually he actually works at Apple. Oh, that's yeah. He did tell me he worked at Apple, but he didn't tell me that. I know I've I've actually he, done he, some work at Apple too, and they're pretty secretive. <laughs> yeah, he, so, he's the he was the he was the creator of shortcuts. Oh, that's amazing. He's such a nice guy. It was just so awesome to see like a young a young person into Amiga, you know, at a vintage computer festival, and not just that, but like doing something really amazing, like recreating the preview guide. It's so cool. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so Jeff, so let's, let's start talking about uh, artwork and Andy Warhol. Um, now sure. may be a good time to, uh, do you want to show the video first so people have a bit of a background on it or just want to just go right into it and um, talk about it? Do you want to introduce um, the video or? Well, no, what, you can. Um, well, here's what um, I'm interested in. Tell me, to, um, let's set the scene. So you're working at Commodore. Uh, are you in the marketing, you're in the graphics and you're in the marketing department at this time. Right. And uh, someone uh, approaches you and uh, for this gig. Tell me, tell me about, tell me well, just about that whole well, experience there. Initially, I was actually sent uh, after Commodore um, had purchased Amiga, I was actually um, sent out to Sausalito, California to sort of become the product manager for um, what was Graphic Craft and ProPaint being developed by Island Graphics. And um, I was actually there for several, literally several months uh, leading up to uh, the planned launch event um, but then about, I'm going to say a month or so before the actual launch, I was actually called back to the East Coast sort of unexpectedly, and so unexpectedly that I thought I was just coming back to, to handle something and then would be returning. Left all my stuff in California, didn't even return the rental car. I, I was on a long-term lease and had the just parked the car in the in the airport parking lot, but when I got back, I was told that I wouldn't be going back out there, uh, so I had to arrange for somebody to go pack up all my belongings and send them to me. But uh, they said that they wanted me to uh, that they had hired somebody to do computer graphics, demonstrate computer graphics for the launch of the Amiga, and wanted me to train them how to do computer graphics. I found that to be very confusing because I thought, why not hire somebody that has some computer knowledge to begin with? Um, and I was a little frustrated having to leave, you know, beautiful uh, suburbs of of San Francisco to go to New York City. And um, I said something to one of my coworkers. Um, it, actually, it was Eric Cotton. Said, you know. They're having me go to New York to teach somebody who doesn't know anything about computers how to do computer <laughs> graphics. And he said, well, who is it? I said, some guy named Andy Warhol or something like that. And, and he, was, he was startled. He, Andy Warhol? And I said, yeah, is that, who is that? He said, you don't know that? He's the guy who did the, the Campbell soup cans. <laughs> he was talking about the popular artwork, the screen prints that Andy did. But I wasn't familiar with that art. I thought he meant he designed the labels for the cans that are sitting on grocery store shelves. <laughs> so it was kind of a, I, 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 was, I was even less impressed after that because I thought it's <laughs> a label that's half red and half white and says Campbell's Soup. 
Um, so I went up to New York um, and uh, went to Andy's factory, met him, and all the time still had no idea who he was. It was a really dirty warehouse uh, situation, several floors high, and um, a lot of time I would sit around just waiting for him to become available. I'd wander around the, the his studio looking at what people were doing. Started talking with a gentleman that was uh, helping paint some um, uh, big punching bags, uh, which I now uh, believe to be uh, Basquiat. Wow. Uh, but I had no idea who he, I had no idea who any of these people were. I was more impressed that the likes of Rico Kasich would stop by from you know the the group the cars and at the time it was like oh i knew who that is i was that that was more exciting to me than the fact that i was teaching some guy named andy warhol try to how to do computer graphics <laughs> and um and but uh he was he was very personable he and i got along very well um i would demonstrate things to him he would try to repeat them um a lot of times things would not stick very well, so we would uh, maybe break for lunch, come back from lunch, and he couldn't remember what the right and mouse left button did. Again, I'd have to give him a refresher, the difference between right and mouse, left mouse buttons. Um, <laughs> wow, that's, uh, a, that's incredible. So you, did you figure out who he was? While you were, uh, maybe it's a good thing that I, you didn't know who he was because you weren't nervous or anything. I, I, and no, you were all no, Studio I, I, 54, you know? <laughs> He's a legend. Right. No, yeah. I, I, I wasn't. I, I, I actually did not really grasp who he was even during that time period, um, be, because the style art that he did was very, I'll call it flat. Uh, you know, it was Xerox. I mean, it lent itself. This the technique lent itself very well to the Amiga using. Uh, the uh, A squared frame grabber to do the captures, you know, that kind of gave the uh, Xerox uh, style uh, base image for him to work from. But um, I never, I, I was never, at the time, I was not impressed with his artwork. Um, and I probably was still irritated that I left so uh, or left. San Fran or Sausalito to be there. Right. But now I'm <laughs> so, in a dirty it, apartment, it just, you know, in Grand Village somewhere or wherever it was. And uh, right. I could I could be in beautiful California right now. You know, I heard a story uh, in I actually read it in the Amiga Act magazine, which is awesome, how um, Andy Warhol was at John Lennon's son's birthday party at John Lennon's house. John Lennon had already uh, passed away and he was there with um, Keith Haring, uh, some other noble people and uh, some guy came up to <laughs> some guy came up to uh, Andy and started <laughs> telling him about this computer, this Macintosh computer. And Andy Warhol had no idea who it was. It turns out to be Steve Jobs. So I understand Steve Jobs was actually courting Andy Warhol, you know, for Apple. Um, but somehow I don't know how he ended up going uh, with Commodore. Do you know any of that story? How that how that happened? Sure. Uh, well, I, from what I understand, he Andy was intrigued with the computer, but at the same time. Uh, the um, Macintosh was black and white, and that didn't suit Andy's desire to be have the colors. Look at those colors behind but, you. Uh, that man can't use black and white. Come on. <laughs> but um, my understanding of how Andy got tied in with Commodore was uh, he was a friend of um, a man by the name of Stephen Greenberg, which was... Um, I, I'm not even sure the role he played with Commodore, uh, but he was a big investor in Commodore um, and a larger than life character in New York, uh, had a private elevator to the penthouse in uh, Rockefeller Center to his office and I believe his apartment as well. Uh, so, I mean, he was a larger than life character. Had a, he had a company called Animetrics. Mm. As I understand, um, he's the one that thought that Andy would be the perfect pitch person for uh, Commodore to use for the graphics capabilities of the Amiga. And 
whether it's true or not, as rumor has it, um, Stephen Greenberg, uh, well, Andy did not want to have a, a, a get a check for the his work. He was going through something with the IRS at the time and wanted to be paid in cash. And Commodore did not wasn't in the business of <laughs> running that way. Right. So I'm told that Commodore actually wrote the check to Steven, uh, Steven Greenberg's company, Anametrics, and Steven Greenberg arranged to pay Andy with a shoebox full of cash. <laughs> wow. <laughs> we, that's incredible. I know that, I've never heard that story before. It sounds like working on, I used to work on music videos in the 90s, and uh, we would get paid at the end of a 20-hour day just with a, with a big stack of cash. <laughs> yeah. but, Same thing, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. So, um, yeah, I can imagine, you know, the 4096 color palette definitely appealed to, to Andy versus the, the black and white Mac. I'm glad, I'm glad we got them. Chalk one up for, uh, for Commodore, right? <laughs> yep. Yeah. And, yep. and um, so, so you were there basically teaching him how to use the computer. He didn't even know who Steve Jobs was. He didn't know anything about the computer. Um, from what I understand, that Andy, you know, he was very obviously iconic pop artist, but he also really liked technology. Even though he didn't really understand the technology, it was almost like he he saw it as a new a, a new paintbrush, right? A new a new paintbrush. He didn't care what the paint was made of, so like he didn't really know all the ins right. and outs of the computer. But he saw it as a new medium that he could work with and express himself. Because you know, he didn't just do painting. I know he also did films and he did photography. So this seemed like it was something exciting for him. Well, the the, he loved the Amiga. His biggest concern or biggest drawback was print technology at that time was not um, as as prevalent as it is today. In fact, uh, to get nice prints like he would have needed would require, uh, like an, I think the only thing that existed at the time was an Iris drum printer. Mm. And... Um, that could do poster size uh, computer prints. And those ran $125,000 up, which you would think the likes of Andy Warhol would be like, I'll take two, have a backup on hand, you know, with, with the amount he charges for his, his work. But um, I think he and his management were extremely frugal. Um, that uh, um, even the the furnishings around the the warehouse uh, or his factory were it looked it looked like he picked up uh, tables uh, you know that somebody set out by the curb <laughs> and I mean it was just the o the only place that wasn't like that that I recall there was a very nice um, reception area. And there was an area, a, a dining room table, a long, I, I would describe it, uh, fit for a king dining room table that sat maybe 25, 30 people. It was all, you know, just immaculate. But everything else in the warehouse was dirty and grungy. And so for him to, I, I think it would have been a, a, a big step for him to get a hundred and twenty five thousand dollar printer that makes yeah that makes sense um but i guess he was thinking his end game was print and you know not digital like he saw this as a tool to end up with a print versus just something that's going to stay digital but correct okay his, his goal was the output not not the on screen um and i think commodore had hoped some technology would come along reasonably priced that they could provide to him, but uh, that never happened to my knowledge. Interesting. I guess they were thinking about their ROI, like if we spend $120,000, $150,000 on his printer, how much could we sell his artwork for, maybe? <laughs> well, well, I mean, well, actually, Commodore, um, as, as I believe his only business relationship was for the launch. Okay. After that, he... Um, it, he, Andy and I had kind of developed a friendship from the training sessions. So after the launch, um, he did call me back when he was doing his uh, TV show called Andy Warhol's 15 Minutes, 
for MTV and asked me to come to New York and um, Commodore, uh, you know, had no issues with me going back there. Uh, you know, I, I guess while they didn't have a bu business relationship, they certainly wanted to um, maintain the friendship, uh, you know, the, and wouldn't hold me back from going there. Sure. And then, then of course, when he was doing the uh, interview for the uh, January, February Amiga World, uh, where he ended up being the cover story, uh, uh, he also asked me to come back uh, to be on hand for technical support uh, with him for that. That is a, a classic issue uh, of, a, of Amiga World there. I, you know, I'm mm -hmm. wondering, you were talking about his Amiga. So he, he obviously, he had some Amigas uh, in his studio. I, I heard a rumor, I don't know if this is true or not, but I heard that Timothy Leary actually introduced him to the Amigas. Is that, is that a true, true or false, him and Keith Haring? N not at all. Not at all, okay. Not at, no, I, um, after I left Commodore and uh, uh, ended up working for uh, Aegis Development in Southern California, um, I was there for a short period of time then I broke off and, and started my own business doing the computer graphics for TV shows and movies. But um, actually, I was contacted by Timothy Leary and uh, to work on a, a game that he had uh, in mind called Neuromancer. And I visited um, Timothy Leary's house multiple occasions. There was never any discussion of him getting computers for any other artist. Um, by that time, Warhol, I mean, Warhol had had a prototype from before the Amiga launch, so there would, there would be no logical reason for Timothy Leary to need to um, provide any to Andy. Andy had the relationship with Commodore that probably could call and say, send me a dozen and, you know, they'd be off the next day to him. So he certainly didn't need Timothy Leary for that. And um, as for Keith Haring, I had never heard anything about, uh, when I was working with Timothy Leary, ever heard anything about Keith Haring. Oh, interesting. I mean, it makes a lot of sense because if uh, he had a prototype of the Amiga, like how would Timothy Leary know about the Amiga before Andy Warhol? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, he, he, he was preparing for the launch of the Amiga. How would Timothy Leary know? It's like chicken before the egg situation, right? <laughs> Correct. Correct. Uh, yeah, Timothy Leary, that's interesting that you've been up to his house up in upstate New York there. Uh, no, no, no. This was in California. Oh, in Timothy Leary's house in California. Yeah. Okay. Because he had a house here too. Yeah. And at this oh. point, they recreate that in one of my favorite movies across the universe about the Beatles. And they, they go on the magical mystery bus ride up to Timothy Leary's house and not too far oh, really? from where no, I this, live. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this, this was in uh, the, the hills, um, I want to say Ventura, Ventura Hills there. San Fernando Valley up in the hills there. Amazing. So, I mean, I, I want to play the video in a second, but we're talking about he had a prototype of an Amiga that was given to him by Commodore. I know there was a big uh, Andy Warhol exhibit done by Carnegie Mellon University not too long ago, like a, a, only a handful of years 2014, ago. 2014. It was 2014. So did, like, is this, do any of his Amigas still exist? Does that prototype Amiga still exist? Um, it, yeah, I believe that just about everything that... Uh, Andy Warhol ever possessed is in that museum uh, because he was big on keeping everything, you know, even things that would be considered trash or something. If it caught his eye, he put it in a in a uh, box to save. Um, they, they referred to him as time capsules. And uh, so the, the computer, I believe that they have, they did. I don't think they used that computer for um, recovery of anything, uh, but uh, a lot of the diskettes and so on were things they just were stored away after he passed. Right. I know they were using, um, oh, something like my brain stops working, Jeff. Uh, Chiroflux? The, Cairo, yeah, exactly, to restore. There was like 10 floppy disks or something that they restored. Right. Yep, yep. Um, well, I, I want to see the video. I'm, I'm curious like that, how, how you got your hands on this 
this piece of artwork and this this disc that they they didn't get their hands on, I guess. Um, this is unique well, to you, but yeah, well, good. The, the, the reason for that is um, the uh, the Debbie image was not created in his factory. That was created at Lincoln Center, so it wouldn't have been a disc in his in his box, I guess you'd say. Got it. But uh, the way that I ended up with it um, was uh, on the well. I don't know whether you want to show the video first. That kind of you tells can tell, the story. You can, but... Yeah, but why don't you tell us and then we'll watch the video. You can do okay. the, the brief synopsis. All right. Well, in, in the the morning of the Amiga launch at Lincoln Center, we were going through the rehearsal, and uh, um, I was in charge of the. There were three machines that were being used for the launch, and I was the one overseeing the the center machine, which is where uh, Andy would be creating his artwork. Uh, he was doing that uh, in uh, cooperation with uh, Jack Hager, who was from uh, Commodore Amiga, from actually Los Gatos Amiga. Uh, and uh, Jack had spent a little bit of time with Andy to also to, not so much for training, it was, that was certainly part of it, but it was more to establish rapport, to create a level of comfort for the interview before the live audience uh, at the launch. So, but at the rehearsal, um, they, Debbie was there and they did the, a run through and created a picture of Debbie Harry, which happens to be this image here, or this image here, I guess would be a better way to put it. And um, luckily that was, uh, uh, ABC News was there that morning to get some uh, uh, raw footage so they could actually put it on the nightly news at 6 p.m. before the Amiga had actually launched. But uh, so they were there to get footage of that and they happened to record it. Well, uh, that evening at the actual launch, the lighting conditions were different because the house lights weren't up. And it meant that the initial captured image using the A squared frame grabber wasn't as good as the one during uh, the rehearsal. And as Andy worked with it and tried to use it, the image just it got more more muddled and worse and worse till you couldn't even recognize it was Debbie Harry anymore. Mm. And uh, but that's what the live audience was actually witnessing. The following day or the day after, uh, oh, so. Uh, but that morning, I, I kind of skipped over some there. I After he did the that image in the morning, I saved it to a disc. For me, it, it actually really wasn't even about Andy Warhol. It was about Debbie Harry, you know, Blondie. That was that was where I was, my, <laughs> my kind of um, starstruck came from. And so I saved this picture of this rock icon and I then went and found Andy and said, Andy, I saved the, the picture of Debbie. Um, do you want it? And he said, oh, you can have it. <laughs> and for whatever reason, I don't even know why, with all the time I'd spent with him, this on this occasion, I said, oh, can you sign the disc? And he said, sure. Well, I didn't even have a Sharpie. That, I wasn't prepared for any of that. And somebody in his entourage had happened to have a Sharpie and they handed it to him. He signed the disc, handed it to me and said, here, it's yours. And that's how I, I got that signed disc. That's absolutely incredible. Great, great foresight uh, on your part to save it. I thought maybe you were saving it just in case anything went wrong at the live event. You could, you could have it well, there no, in your pocket. I, I, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I wish I could say it was planning ahead, but that's actually ended up being the case because after the launch, um, launch event, we, uh, I was sent to um, uh, Broadway Video, where we uh, were editing the promo video, the Amiga promo video that ultimately was distributed. And they got to the part in the um, uh, editing process where it was supposed to be Andy's segment. And all the video they had was horrible because it was this muddled, horrible image of Debbie Harry. 
and they didn't know what they were going to do because they couldn't just cut that whole segment out. That was the main part. And I said, well, I have on a disc the image that was uh, created at rehearsal. And so they said, let's see what we can do with that. So I, load, oops, I, I loaded it into the Amiga that we had there in the studio and the hair, I, un, I filled the hair with black so it would go back like it was before. And I, I would say, I guess it wouldn't be lip synced. I mouse synced what Andy was saying. So if it said, I, I'm, I'm choosing uh, a brush and I'm now choosing the fill and that was actually me moving the mouse to match what he was saying at the live event. And then I would click, you know, when it came the fill and then I would click and so refill her hair with yellow. And so that was all edited in. So the rehearsal image is what was edited into the promo video to make it look like it was created live. And if you actually um, look very carefully at the, I'm going to call them the pullback screens when you can see Jack and Andy sitting at the computer, you can see that the Debbie Harry image that's on uh, the screen in front of Andy is not this wow <laughs> this image that's it so all these years when we see the launch of amiga video it comes on amiga forever i've been seeing it all these years that is actually a little uh a little movie magic exactly that, it was that, actually from the rehearsal that's incredible that's not what anyone saw who was actually at the event and, and i and what i'm surprised is of the thousands of people that were at that event i mean it was a a packed auditorium that nobody has ever said oh that's that, i didn't see them that that doesn't that looks much better than what i saw created nobody has ever ever said that even the press at the time did not uh never said andy warhol created a, a muddled image of debbie harry right it it was never called out but um as as you'll see in when you play this video um, the fact that I have the video footage of Andy creating this Debbie in rehearsal proves that that's the case, <laughs> that, that, that it was not done at the live event. That's amazing. I know, I just, I will play the video in a second, but I'm just thinking about that live event. Uh, RJ Michael, you know, he's very active in the media community, great guy, and he's in Viva Amiga documentary, and he's also in uh, Bedroom Stabilians, the Amiga years, and he tells the story, he tells it brilliantly in Viva about how uh, he was very nervous about Andy using the flood fill tool because apparently it crashed a lot, and he was petrified when Andy was gonna, I think maybe RJ says he told him not to use the flood fill or something like that, and then Andy used it during the live event, and, and uh, RJ's heart skipped the beat, but somehow it worked, it didn't guru. <laughs> uh, I, well, I can, I can address that, and, and I'm not, I'm not going to say RJ was wrong. Um, I would say, though, um, I am not sure that I'm not sure which paint program was actually being used at the uh, at the time, because while RJ was developing uh, kind of, I guess, the in-house tool, um, I had been with, as I said, with Island Graphics uh, out there overseeing um, the outsourced graphic craft and uh, pro paint. So, uh, and at the time, as they continued to develop at Island Graphics, they were FedExing in every couple of days, a newer version, newer version. For me, I was always using the Island Graphics software. So I may have loaded the Island Graphics uh, paint program into the machine that Andy was using at that time. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I can't. I, I. I can't recall whether I was instructed to load in RJ's or whether I was instructed to load in Island Graphics, or, or I wasn't instructed and just instinctively loaded the Island Graphics um, because they looked. The, you know, they were modeled the same way as I recall in in the interface. Oh, that makes sense. That's another uh, interesting take on, on how that how it could have worked. 
so far everyone is uh, is loving the interview, Jeff. I really appreciate you coming on today, and uh, yeah, maybe we'll do a Q and A at the end. But I think it would be, now, since we're talking about the launch of Amiga event, now might be a good time to show show the video that you provided. Sure. Awesome. I'm going to switch Great. scenes here. This is I'm I'm really enjoying talking to you, Jeff. This is fantastic. Thank you so much for your for your time today. Um, if I go here, I think I've got it. Where is it? Uh, I was getting I was getting ready. Let's see. Is it there? Uh, I'm just trying to figure out <laughs> where did I put it. Is it there? Okay. Yes. Okay. There it is. Perfect. I'm going to hide that. Cool. Okay. I guess so. So this is um, a video that Jeff provided for. Uh, for the stream. Thank you, Jeff. Let's take a look at the video. This is the untold story of the digital portrait of Debbie Harry by Andy Warhol. In 1985, Commodore commissioned pop artist Andy Warhol to demonstrate the graphic capabilities of their new Amiga computer at a launch event at Lincoln Center in New York City. Commodore produced a promotional video of the event. The following segment from that video shows how Andy Warhol's demonstration was portrayed of his creating a digital portrait of rock icon, Debbie Harry. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Commodore welcomes you to Lincoln Center. We thought there would be no better way to do a creative demonstration than to invite one of today's most creative minds He's a publisher, he's a media star, but above all, he's an artist of the first order. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Mr. Andy Warhol. And with him tonight as a model is the famous recording star, Miss Deborah Harry. Are you ready to paint me? Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here tonight to help assist uh, Andy do his first computer portrait using the Amiga computer. First off, Andy is going to take a digital snapshot of Debbie, which is running on this system, and you can see the image up there on that screen. And we just select the image and it comes down. You found it to be uh, very spontaneous here. Yeah, it's you? great. It's such, such a great thing. <laughs> what more can you say? Uh, well, I can say a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that looks very good. So now we'll uh, we'll, we'll we'll do the hair. So we'll uh, go up to color. Uh huh. And pick yellow. Andy is selecting from the menu bar, which gives uh -huh. you all the features of the the uh, paint system and he's selecting fill and this is a s uh, slow version of the fill just so you can see how Andy decides to work now this is an instance of a leaky flood film yeah. <laughs> well this is kind of pretty mm -hmm. I think I'll keep it okay oh it's beautiful mm. we're all original In reality, this image of Debbie Harry was not created at the live event at all and was edited into their video. In fact, Warhol's diary entry reads, The drawing came out terrible and I called it a masterpiece. It was a real mess. The live event image actually looked like this. The Debbie Harry portrait that was used in the video had been created earlier in the day during a dress rehearsal for the event. Luckily, select members of the press were on hand for the rehearsal and video recorded Warhol as he created the famous Debbie Harry digital portrait. In this case, we need some lights on the model. Andy, where it's one, where it's going in, just click the right button. Yeah, oh, okay. Just click it down. Uh, well, uh, let's get more fun for you. Could you place the camera more? Yeah, a little closer. Oh, no, zoom in, <laughs> zoom in. Can you zoom yeah. in? Technology, it's wonderful. Yeah, zoom in, yeah, zoom in. Oh, yeah, that's great. Okay. Uh, and just click the right. Okay, look look right in the camera. Yeah, that's it. Okay, and let it. Okay. Now save it for you. Yeah. Okay, and then we wait for it to come over. Now what's going on is it's uh, 
this image is being saved in that machine over there, which has the digitizer software. And we'll bring that disk over here so that Andy can then put his own personal touch in using the Graphicraft Paint program, which is the, the artist program that comes with the system. Thank you very much. Okay, and I'll just look. And let me just bring it down for you. And we'll take a look at the palette first. Okay. And then we're just look we're just getting the file off the disk, which is the image of Debbie that was just taken. Go to it. Oh yeah, I'm uh, uh, cho cho uh, choosing the cover color for the hair and the uh, shape of the the uh, the brush I want or the uh, line I want. And so I take the uh, the color and, uh, and the left button. Yeah. Use the left button. It's really incredible how much uh, the images that Andy's done on the computer relate to his previous work in, in uh, doing silk screens and things. There really is a, a direct relationship in, in the appearance of the images. I think it's really natural for his work. Now you've you've been working on this for about a week, Andy. Yeah. You you feel it's uh, pretty easy to learn. Oh yeah, it's really it's uh, well it's the only one I've ever wanted to work on. Hmm. And it's really easy. Yeah. Oh, there. Nice thing. It looks like a Warhol already. Color. I think you could just sign it. <laughs> Warhol's experience at the rehearsal was more to his liking as he reflected in his diary. We ran through it, and the easiest part is running through our thing for the press. That's so easy. The computer was about to be reset. However, due to quick thinking by one of the engineers, the image was saved to a diskette. This is the iconic digital portrait of Debbie Harry by Andy Warhol that is so well known. Warhol signed the diskette and gifted it to the engineer. This diskette is currently displayed with one of the original prints of the Debbie portrait to create an amazing one-of-a-kind assemblage presenting Andy Warhol's most iconic digital artwork. Wow, Jeff, what, what an absolutely uh, incredible, incredible story there. I, I, I like the shot when it zoomed in on your floppy disk there. <laughs> yeah, it's right, right there. Oh, wait, let me go full screen. Hold on. Uh, the, I'm going to move myself. Hold on. Let me, move, let me move myself out of the way there. Uh, there we go. There's the, there it is. That's the actual disk. Amazing. And how cool is it that they had uh, the news crew there, you know, filming all of that? Yeah, I, I, it was, it just worked out. <laughs> and, and actually, I have not told the story for years and years and years because it, it sounded unbelievable. And it was only um, in recent years that um, I was able to discover that ABC footage, uh, news crew footage, that... Um, and to me, it was, I mean, I was so delighted because that was now, it was like suddenly discovering the receipt to, to, that I needed to, to prove what I had to, had exactly. to say. Exactly. It verified your whole story. Like, literally, right. you could see it all happening right there. Absolutely. Right. And I, and I believe that, that um, it's quite possible that uh, Andy's um, digital works in this collection that I'm offering is probably amongst the most provenanced of any 
uh, works in Andy's um, portfolio. What are you What are you offering um, in this in this piece besides uh, what we see on the on the screen there? I mean, well, in ad in addition, um, as I had said earlier, uh, he asked me to come and help him out with um, when he was doing Andy Warhol's uh, 15 minutes show for MTV, and um, during that. Um, uh, for the pilot episode, uh, he was, he had only seen feeding live video into the A squared frame grabber. So we actually did some uh, experimental work feeding the video out as video playback into the A squared frame grabber. Um, and that appears in the uh, pilot episode with a model named Randall Krebs. Uh, but during experimenting, we actually captured a frame and uh, he colorized that. So there's an image of uh, this model uh, by the name of Randall Krebs, as I said. So that's uh, one of the images. And then for the Amiga World interview, um, there were several images that you have probably seen in uh, the, that accompanied the interview article itself. Uh, and incidentally, uh, there's a couple of times throughout that interview where he, they, they mention where he asked Jeff to do something. Jeff, can you, can you adjust something or whatever? That, that was me that they, he's referring to. But um, so uh, I have uh, all of the images that he did during the Amiga World interview. Um, one note that I'll mention the cover of Amiga World is uh, credited, uh, I believe, to Andy, but he didn't do the cover. Uh, that was actually done by Glenn Suoko, who was the uh, art director for Amiga World. Um, uh, Interesting, because Andy Warhol is actually in the image. Let's see if I can find it and, and pull it up. Yeah. Uh, if I, I can probably Google it real quick. Uh, Amiga World. Andy W A R H O. Oh, let's see, I'm pulling it up now. Um, ch -ch 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 -ch. Amiga World. Oh, that's fine. Now, oh, that's good. I, you come up first. <laughs> nice one, Jeff. You, you I see. Uh, okay, I see. Amiga World. Andy Warhol. Amiga World magazine. Cover. Yeah. Yeah. I'm putting some keywords here. Uh, let's see. I know it's the purple one. It's in one of the. It's in one of the. Uh, the articles that I have. Let's see if I go to well, images. Well, of, of that, um, I actually have um, uh, four variants of that cover. Uh, one that Andy did that is quite colorful. Um, oh, here it is. I got and it. About you got time. Yeah. Uh, where did it go? I, I, I got it. There it is. <laughs> All right, I'm just gonna. I'm just trying to make it uh, full screen here, and then, all right, well, this is this will be close enough. Uh, if I go back here, and I go down to desktop, perfect. This is the untold story of the digital portrait of Debbie Harry by Andy Warhol. Okay, and then we go to, and it's. I'm doing this on the fly here, folks. There it is. Screen capture. And then we go to print. There it is. Got it. <laughs> that's that's the cover we're looking at right there. That's the the one with the purple and the red. And it's a it's actually a shot of Andy Warhol, and it's like a, an infinite space because then you see right. yeah the, the shot. And, and the and the way we did that was um, and, and I'll I'll point out something other. Uh, Andy realized that this was going to be for the cover, and but also realized that a normal monitor is in landscape format. So um, he had the idea to turn the monitor on its side so it would uh, end up uh, creating more proportions to the magazine cover. And then we took the video output from uh, the camera, fed it into the Amiga Live so it would appear on the screen. So you are not seeing scaled down versions where they're placed in the monitor, but it's actually 
video inside the video inside the video inside the video creating that real-time uh, infinity effect wow so it's actually a real feedback a video feedback loop happening right there right wow that's like right. that, that is so cool i never heard that story before <laughs> that is and it, i mean andy was uh pretty far ahead of his time. Now everyone's going nine to 16 instead of 16 by nine, right? Yep. <laughs> he, he was way ahead of TikTok. <laughs> that's, yeah. uh, that's, but I never, and here's another thing that's crazy. I've never noticed that the monitor was turned 90 degrees like that. Really? I never noticed. I, yeah, it's crazy. I just, it just never occurred to me. I don't know. I, it, blowing yep. my mind right here, Jeff. That is, that's incredible. Yep. Um, and it, was that his, and, you go ahead. Well, and I was going to say that, uh, when I talked about the provenance, how I have the video for um, the, uh, the from the Amiga launch rehearsal um, for the images that were created during uh, the interview um, for Amiga World, I, a gentleman by the name of Bradford Lurick, who is directing a documentary on Andy Warhol's digital works called 16 Bits of Fame. Um, he recently acquired, um, I believe about 154 candid photographs that were taken by uh, the photographer Edward Judice that day during, during the uh, Amiga, inter Amiga World interview. And so I have access to all of those uh, photographs that show him creating all the different images, which I have saved from that day on another disc so wow. uh, my my collection is 10 digital files on diskette and um, then uh, i was gifted the print um, uh, amiga world um, i'm sorry amiga andy warhol only allowed commodore to produce there's some unsure uh, about this, it, whether it was uh, three prints or two prints. Debbie Harry believes it's two prints, um, but I had heard that there were three prints and perhaps an artist proof that were produced physical prints of the Debbie image. And um, I had years after I had left Commodore, I happened to, I, I still maintained a close friendship with many people there. And so if I was on the East Coast or actually when I end up moving back to the East Coast, I could go to Commodore's offices, get a visitor badge and just sort of wander around and say hello to people and such. And um, one of the vice presidents was leaving the company. I don't know whether it was a result of layoffs or, or what, but uh, I happened to be in their office as they were packing things up. And I noticed the Debbie Harry print rolled up in the corner. And I said, what are you doing with this? And they said, do you want it? You can have that. And so they gave it to me. And um, that's where this print comes from. And um, it's a print that was would have been produced on the, the Iris drum printer um, contemporaneously back when uh, Commodore had that relationship. I had actually, at the time when I was actually working for Commodore, I, I couriered the disc to the printing company and courier, and then went back later and couriered the prints back. Um, and so perhaps they thought maybe I was deserving of one. I don't think they had any idea that of the eventual value that it may have, but here we are. Wow, <laughs> and is the one that's over your left shoulder there, is that the actual print um, that, that you got at Commodore that day? Yes. Amazing, yes. amazing. So there is, there is a piece of, you know, Andy Warhol, that's what he would have liked. He would have liked to have the print of it. And you said that- which, which the museum doesn't even have. Museum only has a photograph of the computer screen. Oh, wow, that's the Andy Warhol Museum in Pittsburgh. Correct. Yeah, amazing. And, and you said there were a couple of other prints as well? You got the one that was um, that no that that's the only physical print. Everything else is is in digital format. Is there there were the the nine there were nine um, eight images from the Amiga World interview session, the one of Randall Krebs from the MTV 
experimental um, image, and then the Debbie. And you said those images are on floppy disks. So what format are they in? Um, uh, I, some of them are in IFF, but there are others on there that um, when I try to read them, it tells me that they're not readable and they could be the P, uh, well, now I'm, now you're, <laughs> now you're straining my technical. Oh, memory. no worries. Um, I, I, I've heard something like, is it P, PLBM or? I know ILBM, I don't know. I don't know. I, ILBM, but I think there was something else. Mm. Maybe, maybe not, it, it, it could, but there are some that that current paint programs won't read. So it's possible, to be honest with you, whoever ends up acquiring the, the, the tangible assets here could end up with other images that I'm not even aware of. Amazing. Like, they said it's IFF PLBM. Thanks, Sigurdborn. There we go. Yep. So my, PLBM, right. Uh, and Amiga Cami saying that Mike from Colanto has the software that's needed to read those images. He's the one that owns the rights. <laughs> Mike from Cloyanto, uh, Mike Batliana, oh, he's oh, the one who owns the Kickstart oh. ROMs. And okay. yeah, and he, he's the one who owns um, Amiga Forever, which he bought the rights to the launch of Amiga event uh, as well. So he, he would be the guy to talk to. I can put you in touch with him if you want. That'd be cool. <laughs> okay. That's wow. But that's quite the collection uh, you've got there, Jeff. That's uh, I, I'm, what a story. I, I'm just absolutely uh, blown away that it's, that it's coming out now. I guess the timing was, was good because uh, I guess, was it finding the ABC footage that kind of motivated you to do it? Because I'm sure when you were seeing uh, the first batch of Warhols come out in 2014, you were probably um, thinking like, wow, I, I know I've got something special too. I did. Um, and part of me wondered if they would actually have the images as well from the Amiga World interview. But um, what I've come to realize is that I probably have one set the other set probably went to Amiga World where they picked what they wanted and um, has most likely been lost. Um, I, I spoke with Guy Wright, who was the editor uh, of Amiga World. I spoke with him a couple years ago and um, he had unfortunately had lost all, he said he moved and he lost all of his uh, I guess, collection from then, including the audio recording of his interview with Andy, mm. which is unfortunate, but. That's, uh, it's, you know, that's why when something like this uh, pops up, you really understand how special it is because, um, you know, th things get lost over time. Things don't, people don't understand the value, you know, of them at the time. Uh, like, for mm -hmm. example, I'm sure when you were handed that print at Commodore, they didn't quite, they weren't, thinking ahead of <laughs> well, well yeah. ne neither yeah. i mean for me it was it was more of a uh, of just oh i had something to do with that and decided to take it you know it was being offered so i took right. it uh, but it ended up in a poster tube in my closet for years wow. until a friend of mine came across it and said what is this and rolled it out on the dining room table and said how do you have this and why is it just rolled up in the closet? <laughs> and I said, well, and I went on to say, well, I also have the floppy disk with a file on it that has it that he signed. And he was like, are you, are you out of your mind? This thing. And that, that's when it uh, got, got the attention to be framed like this. To me, it makes it a lot more special than just a, a standard digital like NFT file because you've got the actual floppy disk, you've got the Warhol signature, and then you've got the print, which is, you know, mm -hmm. it doesn't get much better than that. <laughs> I didn't realize that that, right. that print in there was the actual print from back then. That's incredible. Yes. That's, that is incredible. Yeah. I got some, um, let's see, if I go here, I can show you some, this, this article is really good. In Artnet, they show a lot of the photos that I think you're, you're talking about. There's Andy, who, you're probably in one of these photos. There's someone like leaning over, helping him with the Amiga right now. I don't know if you, you probably can't that's, see this. That's me. That's in you? the blue shirt. Yeah, blue shirt. Blue dress shirt. That's yep. you. Yeah, blue shirt. You had, it looks yep. like you might have had a mustache. Yeah. Yep. yep, that's you helping him. That's it. <laughs> oh, oh, there it is. Andy Warhol working on computers with the help of Jeff uh, Bruett and uh, Glenn Suko. Amazing. Yep. Yeah, this is... Okay, and there you are um, with Kenneth Mitchell. As he's helping you with the sale of the items. Right. Kenneth Mitchell's overseeing the sale of the 
collection. Amazing, amazing. And there's the there's the the cover that we're talking about, Amiga World. Uh, and there is so it, Pro Paint. I'm I'm curious. That's so cool. <laughs> I, I'm still blown away that that's not the image that's in the video. I'm, it's still blowing me away. Oh, and okay. So I'm looking here now. This is a self-portrait that Warhol created in 1985 using the Commodore I mean, computer, and it's a shot of your a 1084 monitor um, with the Pro Paint image of Andy on it. Can you tell us a little bit about that one? Well, which, which image was that? Uh, um, so it's, what, it's, it's what, actually I, I can't see it. Yeah, it's a my... it's a photograph of like a 1084 Amiga checkmark monitor, and then on it is a it's a shot of Andy. It's a it's a self portrait by Andy Warhol created in 1985. It's a, it's and, actually and what, what color is the image of Andy? The background is red. There's a lot of red in the background. His hair is yellow. His okay. face is gray, and his shirt is green. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, that. I'm not sure if that actually appeared in the, in the, that was actually from the Amiga World interview. I'm not sure if that one appeared or not in the, in the article. Um, yeah, I don't remember this one. I'm, I'm looking at artnet.com right now. Okay. The, the article about you and artnet.com. That, that may, that may be a, a one that hadn't been seen before. Um, but the, the ones that I have, I have, there's one of Dolly Parton. Uh, and Debbie, I mean, and not Debbie, Dolly Parton and Andy. Um, there's one of the Absolute Vodka Bottle. There's the one you just referenced with the red uh, background. Uh, Andy, uh, Andy's face kind of close up with yellow scribbled hair. There's another one that's uh, rather dark, dark blue and green. Um, uh, a green uh, Dolly Parton with Andy's face almost in the shadows. And then there are um, three color variants of uh, and, and pose variants of the Amiga World cover. And a fourth one of uh, that same pose, but where Andy went and painted his shirt purple and the infinity, e each one going into infinity, painting his shirt a different color. Interesting. Um, that's, wow, you, have, you got quite the collection there, Jeff. Can you tell us, I, I wanna open it up to questions too, because a lot of folks have asked good questions. Sorry, I've been totally focused sure. on talking to Jeff. Uh, so sorry if I missed your question, folks. But um, can you tell us a little bit about the actual you know, technique that he used? I know he used a frame grabber. It was, I know Digiview, that's what I had, I had Digiview. And then he yep. would use the paint program to, to Warhol it up with all the color, right? <laughs> right, Warhol it up, yeah. Um, that actually it was done with the um, A squared. It was called Amiga Live, A, A squared frame grabber. It was a um, really innovative piece of hardware developed uh, by an engineer named Arthur Abraham. Um, and uh, um, I guess the marketing side was of that same company was Wendy Peterson. And um, Unfortunately, Arthur is no longer with us. Um, but uh, um, anyhow, he uh, th this was a frame grabber piece of hardware that attached to the side of the Amiga. So it had direct access to the memory. So as it was capturing video, you were seeing it live on the screen in real time, um, uh, where it was you know could modify the video memory. And uh, when you, it, it did not, it's, it, it didn't connect in directly to any paint program. It had its own software, but you could do colorizing and create different effects, then save the image and then load into the paint program, which is what Andy was doing. Um, it makes sense, that's, that's, a, that's a nice frame grabber. Cause I know when I was using Digiview, I want to, take a frame graph from video, I need to have like super perfect pause capabilities, flying a race head, right. or I had to take yep. it from a laser disc player. It was impossible to get a good, a good grab, you know, with that. <laughs> Unless you right. had the right, right. This, this, equipment, that that's, makes it a lot easier. Right, the A square was all in real time with NTSC input um, that uh, was expecting to, to be, you know, capturing 30 frames a second or thereabouts. Amazing. Um, so, so a lot of folks would like to know a little bit more. They're they're very excited about Jay Miner. If you worked with Jay Miner, if you had met him, I I met him. 
Um, I did not work work with him because he was out of the Los Gatos facility. And as I said, when I was in California, I was actually up at Island Graphics in Sausalito. So he was a person that I would see, meet, um, be around on occasion when I would go down to the Los Gatos facility, but I did not have regular interactions with him. I remember Mitchie though. Mitchie the dog, dog yeah. <laughs> yeah Jake, I was, one of the highlights of uh, my life, I guess I'll say, is I was at Amiga, Ami Expo down in Washington, D.C. in 1990, and um, he actually took like 20 minutes out of his day, or it seemed like 20 minutes of time to talk to me about the user group and stuff. Oh. And he was the nicest guy in the, in, in the world. And I, I, you know, I've never heard anyone say a bad thing about him. Everyone's just like, wow, he was just a great yep. person, super smart, nice guy. And ever since then, I'm kind of like model my, my own life after J Minor. I, I want to be nice and kind and generous in my right, time well, with J Minor. And, and he didn't have, a, have the, the uh, attitude of a big exec. I mean, he was just, another one of the the staff yeah. you know co-workers incredible so other images that exists um yep yeah, if you want to you know offline i do the amiga community is amazing i'm sure someone can come up with some sort of software to help you uh look at those images <laughs> um hmm. yeah okay. that, that would be that'd be uh really really neat jeff i'm just looking to see if there's any um any more questions anyone has uh for jeff this has just been absolutely uh amazing i'm sorry i missed the raid uh Appreciate you uh, who raided me. I'm sorry, for, uh, Mr. Raid. It was Cloaked Alien. Cloaked Alien, thank you for the raid. Sorry, uh, I didn't say at the time, but we're super lucky. Uh, today we're doing an awesome interview with Jeff Bruett, uh, who is a former Commodore engineer, and he has recently, uh, he's, he's selling some very, very rare Andy Warhol artwork, and he's telling us the story behind the famous Deborah Harry portrait that Andy did at the launch of Amiga event, and it's just been super interesting. This is one of the coolest stories I've heard uh, in the Amiga community in a long time, Jeff. This has been awesome. <laughs> uh, Fishbot is asking, how did the Amiga platform influence your, your artistic style, Jeff? And uh, what do you think made it unique compared to other systems at the time? Because you're obviously a talented artist. You said after Commodore, you went on to work in film and TV, so. Yeah, the, yeah. I, I would say that for years following uh, the Amiga, it, it sort of guided me uh, because it was great for prototyping. Um, in uh i i i would say that i was never what i would describe myself as a fine artist i mean jim Sachs owns that <laughs> that, uh, that uh, uh title um i was more of a uh pixel artist creating taking advantage of the technology the tools um to create effects or, um, for example, uh, after Preview Channel, I was then uh, given an opportunity to work with a company called Hughes Network Systems, which is a sister company to DirecTV, when they were coming out with their first um, set-top box for receiving DirecTV. And uh, they hired me as a contractor for 40 hours to design uh, some interface screens, what would be the first interactive guides. And I did, and they were so impressed, they extended it for another 40 hours. And that continued on until I was there for five years, um, where I, uh, a programmer, um, Amiga programmer by the name of Wayne Lutz, uh, did all this programming we created a complete mock-up of the first interactive on-screen guide, uh, even connected to a, an old school the laser discs that would, you know, that were record sized laser discs where we had little segments of different kinds of TV shows. And you could choose from the, on, on our on-screen guide, a program and, uh, but uh, we used it to go around the country and do focus groups uh, to get feedback on the user interface design. Uh, but that was all done with an Amiga. Um, so I, I, I can't really sit, lay claim to it influenced my artistic capabilities. I would say it influenced my graphic 
capabilities because I, I don't really hold out the kind of stuff I did as artistic. It was more technical graphics. Oh, well, there's a lot of art to technical graphics as well. You know, when, when I was a kid in school, like in grammar school, um, I wasn't good at drawing with a pencil and paper. So and I, I just assumed that I wasn't good at art. I didn't know anything about art, so I didn't pursue it. But then later on when I picked up a, a camera and I realized like, oh, I, I'm good at taking pictures, that was, uh, and I realized, oh, photography is actually an art form as well. So a lot of the things uh, that you were doing, mm -hmm. you're just because you're not doing pixel art like Jim Sachs, uh, doesn't mean that right. you're not, there's not a lot of artistic talent behind it. I, I, I'll tell you, the one thing I really wish even till today is that somebody would do deluxe paint for the Mac or a PC. I want to paint in, in, from a color palette of pixels, not where I have, you know, I, I just liked all the tools and the way they worked in deluxe paint. Uh, there's a JavaScript deluxe paint you can do online. I think they actually have deluxe paint. I forgot which one it is. Uh, really? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'll send you the link. I'm sure someone in chat probably, let me look, probably already posted the link. <laughs> uh, <laughs> or we'll hook you up with an, an Amiga emulator and uh, get you some deluxe paint. Oh, no. And not only, I, I, I want to I paint natively. Natively. On uh, a Mac. <laughs> oh, there you go. But it, with deluxe paint tools. Okay. That's, that's cool. I think GIMP, is that one that people use a lot? Uh, or Pixel Graphics. Graphics. Graphics is, is, is like an homage to someone who really liked. Uh, Deluxe Paint made this uh, program called Graphics that runs natively on, on the Mac, yeah. and you can uh, do and some I really cool pixel art on that. And, and I always wonder whatever became of uh, Dan Silva, from uh, the programmer for Deluxe Paint. I lost track of him over the years. I'm not sure either. I, I feel like um, I feel like he might have been interviewed on a podcast recently. I could be oh, really? totally, I could be totally wrong. I have to ask uh, the, the the retro hour guys if he uh, if he wasn't interviewed. I'm sure it was them. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll throw in an embarrassing plug here. But uh, all of the um, deluxe paint instructional videos that Electronic Arts put out, I did all of those for them. So if you go into YouTube and you look up, you know, you'll hear, hello, I'm Jeff Bruett, and welcome to Professional Techniques for Deluxe Paint 3. No, In wait, hold on, Jeff. Minutes, oh, keep, I, I, got, I got it right here. I got it right here, Jeff. <laughs> And and is my picture on the back? Well, let's say one second. I gotta put my headphones back on. I'm uh, I'm doing a new technique here. Let's see. Is it uh? Let's see. It says, it says our host takes you right inside D Paint Four guided tour, and then we got uh yeah these are okay these are Deluxe Paint Four, uh, VHS videos. <laughs> I'll have to I'll have to load them up and see. But um yeah my friend Thierry he's got AmigaVideo.net and he's like tried to his his mission was to get like the best quality archive of the classic videos, so um, yours is definitely up there. I'll have to send you the link to AmigaVideo.net. That's awesome. Oh, that's crazy. Um, yeah. Yeah, I know Andy Warhol died really young, really young. It was really, really yeah, sad. Yeah, he, he died in 87. He only died maybe about 18 months after the Amiga launch. Uh, that's really, that's really, really sad. But he definitely, he definitely left his mark uh, on the world, on the art community, and, uh, and on us, Amiga fans. Um, so, Jeff, like, if someone watching is interested in your collection uh, and the possible purchase of it, how would they reach out to you? How would they? Uh, um, uh, s send an email to me, jeffbruett at gmail.com, and I will put them in touch with Kenneth Mitchell, who is the sales agent uh, for the collection. Oh, fantastic. Uh, that's uh, is quite the collection. It's going to be someone. I wonder. I'm curious if whoever ends up with it uh, goes public with it. Now, I would I would love to see if some of those images can can be recovered. That would be amazing too. Mm. Um, and like I said, the media community is incredible. If anyone can figure it out, it's the <laughs> it's the folks like who are active in the community now. Like I always say on these streams, like I'm the I'm the dude on the camera, but it's really all the folks who watch and are in the chat that are they're the real mm. smart ones. It, it, you'd be amazed, Jeff. You would be uh, absolutely amazed. Um, this has just been uh, amazing. Uh, I don't know if anyone has got any more questions for Jeff. They're putting some links into the chat now. Uh, Dpaint.org. <laughs> And uh, where you can actually go use DPaint like in a in a web browser. Oh, okay. <laughs> Which is really I, really I, cool. I, yeah, check that out. Everyone said it was a great interview. They appreciate you coming on. They appreciate you telling your story and sharing like these incredible insights into Amiga history with us, Jeff. It's just been 
Awesome. I really appreciate you coming on. I appreciate your time. Oh, and oh, Janiac is asking, is that Andy's actual 1000 behind you? No, it's not. No, 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 no. I, the, the museum would never let that out of their, their hands for nothing. Yeah, so, you know. <laughs> I imagine. A very interesting story. Uh, very good interview. Thank you guys so much. Uh, amazing guest, amazing interview. Pixels at Dawn from MEGAC Magazine, great interview, so interesting. Oh, Greg had a good question. Uh, the video that you sent to me that we showed on the stream, uh, they're wondering yeah. if it's available online anywhere for them to watch. If, if, if not, I can put it on my YouTube channel if you want, or you, you can, you know, if you have a YouTube channel and want to put a link, whatever you want to do, if you want um, to get out there. I, it, it's, that is not out anywhere. Um, um, there, there will be a website probably before the end of the day called digitalandyart.com um, that will have some interesting resources and where you can see all the different images. Um, that's not live at the moment. It'll be, like I said, end of, the website's done. It just needs to be put live and mm -hmm. ran up against the clock for this interview, so didn't get a chance to make it live. What's the but, URL again? What's it going to be called? Digital Andy Art. Digital Andy com. Art. I want to. Uh, I want to make sure I write that down. Include it in my in my goodie bag. Digital Andy Art. I'm just gonna put it right. D I G I T. Digital Andy Art. Excellent. So that's where the video uh, will be. DigitalAndyArt.com. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Um, and Jeff, what are you doing? What are you doing these days? Are you still Are you still working? Are you still? No, uh, I'm. I'm retired. Um, um, just Just retired and. Trying to trying to enjoy life, I suppose. Well, you're doing you're doing great things. Uh, everyone, great interview. <laughs> Thanks so much for all your time, Jeff. Uh, appreciate Thank you. amazing and Thank interesting you for interview. Having me. Yeah, Jeff, this was really awesome. You know, I just uh, I, as soon as I heard about the story and I read the articles about you, I was like, oh man, I think I, I would love to talk to Jeff because I'm sure he's got some <laughs> interesting stories. Then you sent me that video, and I was like, oh man, this is gonna be awesome. <laughs> and but Jeff, let's definitely keep in touch because I want to, uh, right. you know, invite you to the Vintage Computer Festival East for the Amiga 40. If, you know, no pressure, but you're if you're yeah. if you're into it, and we'll just keep in touch. Sure. Uh, you know, on online as well. I love to hear how the sale goes and. You know, if if the whoever buys it is uh, willing to you know share share uh, their identity, it'd be interesting to see who gets it and what they do with it. Right. It'd be very cool. Our yep. best interview yet. Awesome guys, Jeff. Thank you so yeah. much. Uh, I'll be in touch. Thank, thank and, you. And that was that was really great. I hope you had fun. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> bye, bye. bye bye. Bye bye. Great interview. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Whew. He was a really nice guy. He was a really nice guy.